Turn the mic on. Yes, it's on, isn't it? Um, all right, so settle that stuff back down back there. But uh, two weeks ago, last time we were studying, we had missionary last week. And uh, what a blessing. Amen. Missionary was here, Dewey, Brother Dewey Whitfield. Um, so enjoyed that service. Uh, but uh, we are not to uh, be simply satisfied with past blessings. But God can bless us tonight. Amen. And give us understanding and give us wisdom. But anyway, two weeks ago... We got to studying about Judas, and, and the question was posed, well, did Judas have a choice? And that's what we're going to examine today, and with the material that I have, we're not going to spend any time in study or in review, as we're going to just look steadfast into, um, into that question here tonight. So Luke chapter 22, when you, when you find your place, we'll stand, and, and I have a lot of text, um, and I have a lot of scripture references that we uh, will give you. But I don't know that I will read a lot of it, so I do encourage you to take notes and, uh, and uh, with that. So anyway, Luke chapter 22, when you find your place, please stand. Read a few verses here. Beginning in verse number 1. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being the number of the number of the twelve. And uh, he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him uh, unto them in the absence of the multitude. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. Uh, I pray your blessings be upon the reading of it, the study of it. Uh, give us wisdom and understanding, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. So, again, the question is, did Judas have a choice? And what we're talking about, of course, is the choice to betray, to betray Jesus. Uh, as many, if, if I'm sure probably all of you know uh, the story, we've been studying it, how Judas was, as the Scripture says, he was one of the twelve selected by Christ to uh, be um, one of the apostles of Jesus. And Judas, as time went on, just before the uh, Passover in which Jesus would be crucified, Judas would betray Jesus and uh, sell him for 30 pieces of silver unto the chief priests. He would lead the band out there to the Garden of Gethsemane. He would say, uh, Hail, Master, and he'd kiss Jesus and... Uh, of course, the rest is literally history. Jesus would be taken. He would be tried by the, um, uh, by the chief priests and the Pharisees there at night. He would be taken then in the morning unto Pilate and be tried there. He would be put up for, uh, for a choice between the people, between him and Barabbas. He would be scourged. Uh, well, in, and in the midst of that, he would be sent to Herod and sent back from Pilate. He would be scourged. He would be uh, trod up. Golgotha, and he would be crucified uh, there upon Mount Calvary. They would take his body. Who can tell me the two people that took his body? Joseph of Arimathea and who? Yeah, him and who? Nicodemus. Nicodemus, right? All right. So Joseph of Ar Arimathea and Nicodemus, they'd beg the body of Jesus. They'd take him down, put him in the, uh, in the uh, tomb, and then three days later, that tomb was empty. Amen. All right. What is, what was that? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's fine, brother. All right. So anyway, that's the story. You know the story. Uh, but then concerning Judas, after Judas would betray Jesus, then Judas would go and uh, go back to the chief priest, and he tried to give him back the money. They wouldn't take it. He threw it down and then went out and, and uh, hanged himself. So that was the story of Judas. Now the question is, did Judas have a choice on to do that, or was that foreordained by God and caused by God or by Satan? We're going to look at that uh, here tonight. So 
in, in this question, did Judas have a choice? In my estimation, there are three options, okay? There are three options concerning Judas. Either, number one, God's sovereignty dictated Ju Judas' actions. In, in other words, God said, this shall be done. Judas had no choice in the matter. It was solely God that decided that. That would be the first option. The second option would be that Satan possessed uh, Judas and forced him to betray Je Jesus uh, in other words, it was Satan's will. Satan possessed him, uh, caused him to do it. Judas was simply the vessel in which Satan used to uh, betray Jesus. So in the first option, it was God's will that forced the matter. Second is Satan's will that forced the matter. And the third one, of course, is Jesus chose of his own free will to betray Jesus. And as far as I know, that's really the only three options that we can determine or, or, you know, that you could even contemplate as to uh, what caused Judas to do what he did. And so tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to examine uh, those, three, uh, those three options. First one we're going to look at is God's sovereignty dictated Judas' actions. In other words, it was all God. Judas had no choice. Judas was just part of uh, the... Uh, um, you know, one of the cogs in this great machine of salvation that God had foreordained, and he, Judas had no choice. God made him serve the purpose in which God had have him uh, to do. Judas acted according to God's will, not his own. Okay, that's the first one that we're going to look at. Now, this uh, viewpoint, this viewpoint would be uh, akin to uh, Calvinism. How many are you familiar with what Calvinism is? S sort of somewhat. Let me explain what Calvinism is. And Calvinism, if you were to study it out, it would give you the acronym of TULIP. T-U-L-I-P, if my spelling is correct. Uh, T would stand for total depravity. U stand for un um, unlimited atonement or something along those lines. But if you were to wrap it up in a nutshell, what Calvinism is, is it believes that, or, and the other, the other name for Calvinism today is called Reformed Theology. And there's a lot of quote-unquote Baptist churches that operate under Reformed Theology. In other words, they're Calvinist in nature. Okay? And I'm talking about Baptist churches. Now, uh, Reformed Theology or Calvinism essentially states this. And they will say, because God is sovereign... And whenever I'm talking about Calvinism and I am explaining God's sovereignty in those eyes, you will often see me using the air quotes, okay? And that is, the reason is, is because their view, the whole problem with Calvinism is it begins with their misunderstanding of what the word sovereign means, okay? But they view that because God is sovereign that nothing happens in this world unless God has foreordained that it should be so, okay? Nothing takes place in this world without God's direct involvement of causing it to happen. And this holds true for salvation. God has foreordained, He's chosen those who are going to be born again, and those that are going to be damned to hell forever, okay? That is what Calvinism is in a nutshell, that no matter what, God has chosen the, the order of things. And that is their view of sovereignty. God is in complete control. And it leads to such conundrums as what John Piper once said. John Piper, big-time Calvinist, uh, he, he said this, and it's on YouTube, you can look it up. He said, I do not understand... Um, how man is accountable because he is. In other words, the soul that sinneth it shall die. I don't understand how, I don't understand man's accountability and, and God's sovereignty. I cannot see how God essentially forces men to go to hell and they're going to be accountable. He said, but both of them are true and, and, and that's not for me to decide. It's, it, it's the silliest type of, of doctrine. Um, that, that's what Calvinism is, or Reformed theology. I hope that I have, I have explained that correctly. And, and, and it leads you to other questions such as, okay, well, if I sin here, if I sin, whatever sin that, that is, 
If God is in complete control and God is sovereign and God has dictated the order of things, does that mean God made me sin? God forbid, but that's what it teaches. Okay? It's Reformed theology uh, or uh, Calvinism. And so when we're talking about, well, God forced Judas to do this, this is the road and this is the mindset in which you have to study and understand. Um, it would demand that God forced Judas to sin against him. Now, I have here, I said, Pharaoh, the Calvinist's best friend. And I want to study Pharaoh for a minute because that was one of the examples that was given here a couple weeks ago when this question was um, brought up. Several times in Scripture, several times in Scripture, I have the, uh, the quotes there, Exodus 4, 21, 7, 3, 9, 12. Uh, throughout the Exodus experience, from the calling of Moses to the leading out of the children of Israel from Egypt, you have quotes that would be attributed to God hardening the hearts of Pharaoh, okay? And because of those quotes that, you know, God said, I, would, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will not, you know, let the children of Israel go or whatever. Because you have those quotes, that is, that's the food for f fodder for the Calvinists to cling on to. See, well, Pharaoh didn't have a choice. Pharaoh, God, the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. On the same token, though, you have several times, and there's other uh, scripture quotations there, uh, Exodus 7, 13, 14, 22, 8, 15, 19, 32, and you can go on and on, where Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Okay? So you have scripture references where it says God will harden Pharaoh's heart. He said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And you have several scripture references throughout the entire experience where the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. You have both of those that you have to contend with. Uh, but the question remains, and that is this, how, how, how did God harden Pharaoh's heart? How did he do that? Did he make the choice for him? Did he make it to where Pharaoh could not in any way or shape or form choose to voluntarily let the children of Israel go? How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? A lot of people take that to mean that, uh, that that's exactly what God did. God, God made it to where, whether he blinded his eyes, whether he did whatever, to where Pharaoh could not ha do any other, uh, anything else. But here's, here's my thoughts on the matter. My thoughts is that uh, God didn't actively, in other words, he did, not, he did not make Pharaoh make his decision. But because of God's actions and because of God, what God did, the result of it, was Pharaoh's decision. So let me give you an example. If I, if I were to um, preach on faith, or if I am to preach a faithfulness to the house of God, and, and if I'm going to, you know, do whatever, you know, uh, I will, I will, in effect, by my words, standing on the word of God, there will be some that say, Oh, I, you know, you hear this a lot. Oh, preacher stepped on my toes. Anybody ever heard that said that? Oh, preacher stepped on my toes. In other words, it brought conviction. It brought a contrite spirit. And then you have the other reaction. Then you have the reaction is like, man, that preacher, I can't, I can't believe he said that. He's probably talking directly to me. I wonder who told him my situation because, you know, this is really, it's coincidental that he would say something like this. And they get all puffed up and they get mad. And they get angry at what the preacher said. And it causes their heart to what? Harden. Right? And when you look at the, if, if you were to go back and say, like I said, we don't have time today because I got so much I want to get through with this subject. But if you were to go back and look at the actions of what God did, God brought miracle after miracle after miracle. You know the first time that the Bible actually says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart was after the fifth one. It's after the fifth one. I want to say it was on the sixth one. It was on the plague of boils when it says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I believe that it wasn't that God said, okay, Pharaoh, you cannot make this choice. But what happened was God did, and God did, and God did, and God did. And instead of turning with a, a repentant heart, Pharaoh got puffed up. And so in either effect, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. By God's actions, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Does that make sense? 
that make sense? Um, and, and you see that all throughout Scripture. You see that happen time and time and time again. When Jesus opened the eyes of the man of the blind, uh, the, the blind man in John 9, 16, you know, some of them believed, some of them turned, right? And we just studied this in Sunday school. Uh, when Jesus was preaching, some of them believed, some of them uh, wanted to kill him. Uh, when, when Peter preached in tongues, when Peter was preaching in tongues, some of them was like, oh, they were amazed at it. And some of them said, man, he's just drunk. That's all they are. They're just drunk. When Paul was preaching Jesus in Acts 28 after Jesus raised Lazarus, I mean, we looked at that. Let's go ahead and turn there real quick. John eleven forty five. 45. Oh, let me see. John eleven forty five. 45. John eleven forty five. 45. Verse number 44, it says, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus done. Then they gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees' council and said, What do we? This man does many miracles. In other words, the miracle affected some in that they believed in, other, in Jesus, and in the miracle affected the others in that they wanted to kill Jesus. See the difference? See the difference? The difference here, church, is the soil in which the miracle is founded upon. The soil in which the word comes to. That's what makes all the difference in the world. Whether it's stony soil, or whether it's by the wayside, or whether it's good, solid, uh, good soil which will uh, take root. So, uh, you know, as we look there, and I want to explain sovereignty for a minute. Because like I said, you know, the whole air quote thing that I'm doing. Sovereignty. God is sovereign. I, I, I will, I, I, I absolutely believe that. The Bible teaches that. I don't know that the word sovereign is ever used, but, but, but the Bible does teach that God is sovereign, but you have to understand what the word means. You know, I can say that the sky is green. Uh, it doesn't make it so unless green actually meant blue, right? If green meant blue, then the sky is green, and I would be right. But if the sky is blue and I'm saying the sky is green, then obviously I'm wrong. The same, the same would hold true with, with the doctrine of sovereignty. If I say that God is sovereign, I'm absolutely right. If I say that God is sovereign in the fact that he, that, that means that he controls every decision ever, then that's wrong. It all depends on what the definition of sovereign is. So the definition of sovereignty simply means to, to be overall, uh, not controlling all. To be overall, not controlling all. Supreme power authority. That's what God is. There's nobody above God. Amen. God is supreme in power. God is overall. Now, that does not mean that God controls everything. When we talk about, to give you an example of this, I thought about a sovereign king. There's a king, you know, and he's a he's sovereign king over a land. Now, that king, if, if he's a sovereign king over a kingdom, does that mean that he controls all of the actions that that, you know, the little little uh, inhabitants do no right they can do whatever they do that does not mean that he's not sovereign but here's the thing being a sovereign king he has the right and the ability to dictate and govern the way he sees fit and what the consequences are if you disobey the way he decides to govern right See, that's what a sovereign king is. A sovereign king is overall. That means that those that are in that kingdom will have to answer to that sovereign king. And they'll have to answer not according to the way they felt things should be. They'll have to answer to the sovereign king by the way the sovereign king has dictated things will be. That's what sovereignty is. God is a sovereign God. Amen. See, we have the ability to choose and make whatever choices we want to. We do not have the ability to dictate the outcome. We do, not, we do not have the authority to go to God and say, Well, God, listen, I know you said this, but I think this. Why? Because we're not sovereign. He is. And so that's where the difference is in understanding what sovereignty is. The Calvinists think that so the word sovereignty means that God controls everything. But the truth of the matter is, is that God does not control everything, but God is still in control. All right. So let's move on. Exploring scripture when we're dealing with, you know, um, does God control everything or, or do we have choice? What saith the word of God? Well, few questions here for you. Number one, why would God give us his word? Why? Why? 
Why would God give us His Word filled with instructions and expectations if we had no choice what to do with it? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Why in the world, why in the world would I give my child instructions and expectations if they have no control over whether they listen to those instructions? That doesn't make any sense at all. Number two, why does the Bible teach that it is a whosoever gospel if it's not? For God so loved the world that he gave the, his only begotten son that what? Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Then that's a lie straight out of hell if the Calvinist and the Reformed theology is correct. It's not a whosoever gospel. It is a whosoever God has already called. It's a whosoever God has dictated. Right? You know, that, that one verse, and you can go all throughout Scripture, but that one verse, that one verse would be a lie if the Calvinist doctrine theology was correct. Uh, three, uh, why would God um, have to force Judas? This is a good question. Why would God have to force Judas to reject him and betray him when people do it every day? <laughs> I mean, literally, people reject Jesus every day, don't they? You don't have to go far for people that reject Jesus. God could have just used someone that was willing to reject him. fact of the matter is, he did, and that was Judas. All right, so anyway, there's that. Additionally, in our instructions, we are commanded over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to choose. And there's some scripture ex uh, uh, references for you. Exodus 32, 26, Deuteronomy 30, 19, Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Isaiah 1, uh, 18, 65 and 12, Proverbs 1, 20. I mean, you could go on and on. The Bible is filled with instruction on what we ought to do. Choose right, right? Choose. Be ye holy for, 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 for he is holy. You know, they're all choices. And uh, why would we be instructed to choose and, and told to choose if we have no choice? All right, number two. The second option. So if, if God did not force it, the other option that was kind of thrown up, well, well, it was all Satan. It's the whole Satan made me do it excuse, right? <laughs> Satan. Satan made me do it. So the other option is if God didn't force him, then that leaves you with two. Either Satan made him do it, possessed him, or Judas chose. And so, second one is uh, Judas was compelled by Satan to do his bidding. In other words, it wasn't Judas's, wi Judas's will. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, church, that either it, ha it, it cannot be two of these three. In other words, if Satan made Judas do it, do it then Satan didn't, or didn't make Judas do it, right? If Satan made Judas do it, then God didn't make Judas do it. It, it. it can't be both of them. Both of them didn't go together and say, hey, you got an idea. Let's both of us force Judas to do this thing. It either had to be one or the other or neither. Okay? Uh, think about that and, and you'll come to that conclusion. So here at, uh, we, we see this in Luke ch uh, chapter 22 and we also read, in uh, John 13, when Jesus gave Judas the sop, and the Bible says that Satan entered into him, okay? And this is the scripture that is in question, Satan entering into him. That, you know, would lead some to believe that Satan possessed Judas and forced him to do uh, what he had done. We, we read Luke chapter 22. Now, uh, there's twice, two times, where the Bible says that Satan entered into him, and it's two different times. Okay? It's two different times. The first one here is prior to the communion, prior to the Last Supper. Prior to that, here in Luke chapter 22, it said in verse number, uh, verse number 1, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover, and the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan in, unto, into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being known number 12, when his way and communed, and then it says that he, you know, they covenanted with the 30 pieces of silver, and then he promised from that point. Now, the second time is at the supper, after he had eaten, after he'd washed his feet, he dipped the saw, the sop, gave it to Judas, and then the Bible tells us in, uh, there in John 13, that Satan entered into Judas, and he went out and went his way. Let's just go ahead and read it there so, I, so I'm not paraphrasing, okay? John 13. You can turn there. You don't have to turn there. It doesn't matter. Because I'm turning there. I'm reading. Verse number 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake, leaning on Jesus' bosom, uh, 
Um, there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom. Peter asked him, he said, ask him what he's talking about. And uh, verse 26, Jesus answered, he, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, it, Satan entered into him. Uh, then said Jesus unto him, that, that thou doest do quickly. And so there's two different times, two different occasions where we hear that Satan entered into Judas. Now, one of the questions that you'd have to ask is, when we're talking about satanic possession, of what we know about it, I mean, how does this work? Does Satan just go into Judas and then, you know, do a little thing and then come out of him? And then go back into him? Is that what he's talking about? To where Satan is controlling Judas' actions... Satan goes into Judas, and he covenants with him, and he leaves him. And then he goes back, and then later on, after when Jesus dips the salt and gives it to him, then Satan enters into him again, and leaves and goes out and gets the band. Is that how it works? I'm, I'm at, you know, is that how it works? I don't think that's how it works, because, you know, we'll get to more to, to uh, this in here in just a second. But I believe the answer, when we're talking about Satan entering into Judas, is not a matter of possession, but a matter of influence. Okay? It's a matter of influence. Satan giving him influence as to what he should do, leading him in a certain way, because there's certainly satanic influence. Amen? If you don't believe in satanic influence, you have not watched the news. There's certainly satanic influence. There's a lot of satanic influence in our country. But there's a difference between influence and possession. Influence would be a, an urging, a directing. Possession would be a, I have no choice in the matter. I have to do what is being said. And so I believe what we're talking about here, and, and for reason here in just a moment, that um, uh, Satan certainly influenced Judas, but did not force him, could not force him for uh, several reasons. When we, what we know about demonic possession, because it is true, it's in the Bible, amen, it is true, it has, has happened and happens today. But there are certain traits that happen when someone is demonically possessed. Um, there's a loss of speech. There's a dumb man that's talking about being possessed with the devil, Matthew uh, 9.32. Loss of speech and eyesight, uh, Matthew 12.22. That was another one that was, the Bible says, was possessed by a devil, couldn't see, couldn't speak. Uh, there was one that flailed around, foamed at the mouth, had, you know, these epileptic type seizures in Matthew 9, uh, chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 9. Uh, the maniac of Gadara, the one that was insane that broke the chains and, you know, was possessed with legion in uh, Matthew 8, Mark 5. Uh, and then there was another instance in Acts chapter 19. Um, those are traits. They cut themselves, all of these, all of these type of traits. That's what we know biblically about what demonic possession would look like. Now what we need to do is kind of analyze what, what, was, what was Judas like? What was Judas like? And I went through here and I painstakingly took and got all of these scripture references so you could check them out yourself. But I want to go down here through them. He displayed indignation and greed in uh, Matthew chapter 26. And this was the instance when um, the uh, woman, I believe it was Mary, had broken the alabaster box and uh, uh, washed his feet, you know, and dried them with her hair and did all that. And, and he, he and the other disciples that were looking at him like, oh, what is this woman doing? What a waste. What a waste. Uh, we could have taken this and sold it for the poor. The Bible says he had great indignation. And so we see he had indignation and greed there in Matthew 26. And, and after that, Jesus reprimanded it. not only him, but the rest of them, told them all. He said, he said, this woman's doing it for my bearing. He, he reprimanded them all. And so he experienced that reprimand directly after that. Then Satan entered into him from Luke chapter 22. Satan entered into him. Satan influenced him. He yoked up with the heathen. He actively sought to betray him. So this is the order of things. Moving on. After that, we have where Judas supped with Jesus. He ate with him at the table. Jesus washed his feet in John 13. And right after that, that is when Jesus began to be heavy. He said, one of you is going to, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus identified Judas to Judas. Judas, if you read uh, John 13, Judas was the only one that got it. Ju Judas was the only one that knew what, who it was. And uh, like I said, that's, that's John chapter 13. We don't have time. But 
Jesus identified Judas to Judas. Man, he pricked his heart. He said, that which thou doest, do it quickly. Judas had already sought to betray him. And Jesus revealed unto Judas that he knew his heart. And so what happened? Satan entered in. And he got up and left. And then Judas went and, and uh, got the band together. And Judas gave them instructions on how to take him. Judas then, at that point, when he comes up to Jesus, he greets him, Hail, Master! And he kisses him on the cheek. And we talked about all of that, well, you know, a Wednesday or two ago. Um, and then they, they take Jesus. And then the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, let's go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 27, that after that night, after they condemned him with the chief priests, they're going to take him to Pilate. And then Judas is experiencing some other emotions in uh, Matthew chapter 27. It says in verse number 1, then when the morning was come, that's when they were taking him off, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, what's that next word? Repented himself. Notice those two words, repented himself. He knew what he did. And man, he changed his mind. Repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I, I have sinned. Who sinned? He said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to uh, us? See thou to it, uh, to that. And he cast down the 30 pieces of silver, departed and went and hanged himself. And so when we look here, he, he joyfully greeted Jesus and kissed him there in the garden. Judas then sees Jesus, is condemned, and he repents. He gives, Judas gives his testimony, and that's what I wanted, saying, I have sinned. I have sinned in that I have betrayed uh, this innocent blood. And then Judas goes off and hangs himself. So that's the order of events. That's what we know about Judas. That's what we know about he, how he felt and how he reacted according to Scripture. Now, none of those symptoms, nothing in Judas's manner before or after either time Satan entered into him gives any indication of what we know satanic possession to look like, does it? But you know what it does look like? It looks exactly like so many of us experiencing the same thing, greed, avarice, anger, humiliation, Sorrow, guilt. I mean, he experienced all of those things that we do. And why do we experience those things? Because of the choices we make. So, had Judas been possessed, Satan would have had no reason. Satan would have had no reason. Think about that. If Satan is making Judas do something, Satan would have had no reason for Judas to try to trick Jesus into he wasn't doing it, right? Remember how we talked about when he's coming up and he's, Hail, Master. You know, it's a, it's a greeting of cheer. And he comes up and he kisses him. Uh, Judas is trying to trick Jesus at this point. Satan would have had no reason to trick Jesus. What would he have cared if Jesus knew or didn't know? Um, so, uh, there's that. So, I, I, I don't see how there is no indication, at least in my mind of everything that we see in the way Judas acted before and after that he was possessed. By his own testimony, he said, it was me. By his own testimony, he, did, he, didn't, he didn't even go to the chief priest and said, man, the devil made me do it. He didn't even try to do that. He said, it was me. I have done this thing. And so if it wasn't God, and if it wasn't Satan, that leaves us with the only last option, that is Judas, by his own free will, chose to betray Jesus. It was his choice and his choice completely. And we're almost done. Uh, Satan may have influenced Judas. Satan may have influenced Judas. I believe he did. Satan did influence Judas that night and the night or two before that. But Jesus influenced him for three years. Think about that. Jesus influenced. Jesus had, had influence over Judas in the flesh, in the person, seeing all the miracles and everything that he did. Jesus had influence over Judas for three years, Satan certainly influenced him that night. Judas just made the choice on which influence he was going to submit to. Um, Judas chose to betray Jesus. Uh, and because God is God, that's the thing, because God is God, God is sovereign, amen? 
God is outside the bounds of time. I am, we are all slaves to time, right? You can wear a watch on your wrist, it doesn't matter. Time ticks on for all of us. You can take the watch off your wrist. Guess what? Next, next year, you're going to be a year older. Ten years from now, you're going to be ten years older. Uh, Thirty years from now, many of us are going to be dead. You know, time still goes on, regardless of, uh, of whether you're wearing a watch or not. So we're all bound by time. Uh, I'm bound by the time that I have here in this service. Uh, we're all bound by time, but God isn't. God isn't bound by time. God knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, just as he knows what happens yesterday. God is outside. The, and, and God, before God ever created time, space, and matter, those three things, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning was, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, time, space, matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens, uh, space, the matter, the earth. When God created all three of those things, before he ever did, God knew who Judas was. God knew, who, knew what Judas would choose. Therefore, therefore, God did what God does. And that is found simply in Romans 8, 20, 28. And we know that all things work to good to them that love God, called according to His purpose. See, God has a way of arranging things. The choices that we make are our choices, but God arranges things because God is in control. God is sovereign. God arranges things to our good and His glory. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Uh, God is sovereign. He is overall. Judas is most likely in hell. I, I, I hope that he's not. I, that, I think that'd be a great redemption story. I have no, I have no um, animosity toward Judas. It wasn't Judas that, that betrayed Jesus. I betrayed Jesus. I'm the one sinned against you. I'm the one that Je the, the reason why Jesus went to the cross. So I have nothing against Judas. I have nothing against the Pharisees. You know, thank God he went to the cross, right? Um, I, I hope that Judas is in heaven. Man, I'd love for Judas to be in heaven. I just, as I was having a conversation this week, I don't think that he is. And the reason why I don't think he is, because I don't, I don't think God would, uh, I think God would have uh, put that in Scripture. Man, what redemption. What redemption. Let me tell you what, Judas, Judas could be saved just like the, the lowest sinner in, that, that has ever walked the face of the earth. God has the ability and the power in His blood to wash away every sin from whoever. It is truly a whosoever gospel. Whosoever will, that's choice. Judas made his, and we just make ours. Amen. Thoughts, questions, comments? Repentance is a change of mind. Okay, that's what repentance is. Repentance is not always tied to sin or a sin or a particular sin. Repentance simply by definition is a change of mind. He changed his mind about what he did. Now, whether that is, uh, I do not think that that alone is in recognition of a repentance in putting his faith in Jesus. I think that is a change of mind of the sin in which he committed against Jesus, but not that he was putting his faith in Jesus as far as salvation is concerned. Yeah. Yeah. You can recognize sin without ever recognizing the Savior, though, right? Because we can go out and we can witness to whoever. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah. You ever... You know, that, you know that sin. Oh, you have sin. People can recognize sin without recognizing the Savior. You see, those are, those are separate. Um, you have to recognize your sin in order to understand the need for a Savior. But just because you recognize, recognize your sin does not mean that um, you have trusted in that Savior. Brother Marty? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right, but then you take that one step further. 
Right. You take that one step further and, okay, if he did make Adam and Eve to sin, he's made everybody to sin from that point forward, you know. Um, yep. Yeah. Some time ago, I was witnessing to a man, and he challenged me. He said, okay, tell me what it is you believe concerning salvation in 60 seconds. And so that's what I did. And that's what I want to do today. I want to give you the gospel of Jesus Christ in 60 seconds. And the reason why I want to do it that way today is because I believe God's plan of salvation is so simple that you don't have to have some great mind in order to understand it. You don't have to have some great intellect in order to wrap your head around God's great plan of salvation. You see, one of the reasons why God's plan of salvation is so great is because He made it so simple that even the base of us could understand and be saved. So that being said, without any further ado, here it is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to, how to be saved, how to know that you pass from death unto life in 60 seconds. The first thing that we need to understand is that we're all sinners in the eyes of God. See, to sin is to break God's law, and we find God's law summarized in Exodus chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments. We also need to understand that sin comes with a price. And if we stand before God in our sins, we will be judged according to our works, found to be sinners, and cast into the lake of fire where we'll abide eternally. But thank God His grace made a way for sinful men to be saved. Jesus was born without sin, lived without sin, yet was crucified for our sins. You see, a just God must punish sin, and you can either bear the punishment forever in hell, or you can put your faith in Christ Jesus and let Him bear your sin debt. If you will accept the free gift of salvation by putting your faith in Jesus, you can be saved. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can't earn it and you can't work for it. It's God's free gift unto whosoever that accepts it by faith. Well, I trust that was a blessing to you. And above all else, listen, if you're lost today, I want to ask you a question, and it's simply this. Don't you want to know that if you were to die today, that your sins have been forgiven and you have a home in heaven? Don't you want to know that you've passed from death unto life? The Bible says that we can know in 1 John 5. And the Bible says in John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That whosoever includes you. If you will simply put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can confess it in a prayer such as this, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You so much uh, for the gift of Jesus Christ. I understand I'm a sinner and that my sins would send me to hell, but I thank you for sending Jesus to pay for my sin debt upon the cross of Calvary. And Lord, right now I'm accepting that, that free gift by putting my faith in Jesus. And God, now that you have saved me, please help me to walk in honor of my Savior. Help me to live the life that would be pleasing unto you. And I'll thank you and praise you evermore for it. In Jesus' name. And if you will pray something like that, believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you can be saved. I pray that you will, and I trust that you do before it's too late. And if I never see you this side of eternity, I'll see you in glory. God bless.